If you have any graduates in your family, please let the church office know so that we can celebrate them in June. On June 5th, it'll be after the 8 o'clock service. And for the graduates we are celebrating, we need a picture and a hard copy or emailed um, to us and a short informational statement by May 31st, if there's any graduates. That includes you, Ben. Uh, Marsha, myself, will be leading the Bible, a Bible study uh, on Zoom this summer. James is a short book of the Bible, but it's been known to provide powerful, impactful guidance on practical Christian living. This will be once a week, and it'll be on Thursday evenings at 6.30 via Zoom. And there's nine lessons, so we're going to start June 9th and go all the way to August 4th every Thursday. But you do not have to be there to commit to this. You do not have to be there every Thursday. People are busy in the summer. I get that. And I'm going to hopefully record as long as everybody agrees. So if you want to catch up on the recording, you can do that too. Um, and the only book you need is the Bible. And so if you don't have a Bible, you can let us know and we'll get you one. And um, back there is the site. Actually, I've moved it. There's the sign-up sheet is back by the name tags, which, by the way, we have name tags out now. So if you would um, want to wear a name tag so everybody can know who you are, we have them out again like we used to. Uh, bylaw amendments and proposed budget revision was sent out to everyone, either by email or mail last Tuesday. If you have not received these, please let me know, because we really want you guys to have them before and read them and give us any feedback you have before our next board meeting. And there will be a congr uh, congregational meeting on June 5th following the 1030 service. So put that in your calendar if you can. Um, have a, an addition, a couple additions here. Men's choir, um, Wednesday, June 1st and 15th practice, correct? There will not be practice on June 8th. And this is for Father's Day, June 19th. So if anybody is interested, talk to Pat. Um, and there will be practice on June 1st and 15th for the men's choir. We did a similar thing with the women's choir for Mother's Day. Um, and then with that, um, the slips, we, we're going to do one more week of you guys sharing your favorite hymns with us. There's slips in your bulletin to fill out. I feel like I'm forgetting something else that came to mind, but I don't know what it is. Does anybody else have any? Yes. Um, <clears throat> When will that be? Um, the 18th of June. June 18th, Margaret Woodall is turning 102. Uh, so we are going to celebrate, and there will be a sign-up sheet. Gail obviously has all that information if you want to ask her. I remember what the other thing was. Um, I had a request to have a couple enlarged bulletins on hand um, for enlarged print for people that can't read the print on the bulletin. So each week now I'm going to do a couple. Um, so if you need that, and all I did was take a copy and made it 8 by 11 and then stapled it. Um, and so if you need an enlarged print bulletin, just ask the people there. And if we need to make more copies, it'll be easy to do, OK? And if there's any other suggestions like that, let us know, OK? Please, I, I'm very happy to have those suggestions come forward. OK, Amanda. Enter into the children's moment, a moment where one big overgrown child speaks to a smaller child. Yes, love. Perfect. It's actually.
actually works. You know what my favorite part of doing good is, or doing the right thing? Let's hear it. Helping people, that's a good, that's a good one. What about you? Do you have, what is your favorite part of doing right or doing a good thing? That's perfect, those are both excellent answers. My favorite part is getting rewarded, right? <laughs> No, is that wrong? That's, that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. In fact, oftentimes, not oftentimes, but sometimes, we do the right thing because we know people are watching, right? And we know that we're going to get rewarded. You might get a cookie or you might get to go to that thing. I know I tell my kids a lot that if you get a, a, a good marks at school. If you don't get in trouble at school this week, we're going to go to Five Below and you can spend five dollars and get five poorly made toys. <laughs> but today we're going to learn about a moment where Jesus did the right thing for somebody that didn't even say thanks. And that's something. That's kind of hard to do, especially when it's somebody who wasn't really nice about it to begin with. But Jesus still did something nice and help someone that wasn't nice to him and didn't even say thanks. Sometimes it's really, really hard to do the right thing. One, when nobody's looking. Two, when you know that you're not going to get anything in return for it. But here's the thing. Kind of like Gail said, when we do the, good, the, the right thing, it makes us feel good, right? But as we do more right things, as we continue to do the good things, God changes us a little bit. Because God teaches us through our good things that we do. Does that make sense? Thanks for listening to my overgrown child. Spiel. That's my second children's sermon. It's not going to be my last. And I still didn't bring a coloring page. We'll now go into a moment of pastoral prayer. Before we do, do we have any prayer requests that would like to be added? I have a joy. I want to talk about yesterday. Um, so we went to the car we had to at um, Christ Church. mother in your prayers because that it sounds like it's going to be something to recover from. Yes. Yeah, there have been a lot of storms, uh, especially in the Midwest lately. Keep those affected by the storms in our prayers. <clears throat> Any others? Yeah, you probably will be tired of this one, but our our dear people that we love so much in Afghanistan, but part of it's a joy. Senator Duckworth's office has successfully con you know, funded the government enough 
that Omar has gotten another letter from them um, in terms of information. And he has, you know, everything turned in, but we still need prayers to get him and his family out of the country safely. Wonderful, thanks for sharing. Any others? All right, uh, continue to pray for me. I, for some reason, I thought I had another two Sundays after this, but I can't seem to get it right. I guess it's one more Sunday after this. And then I'll be uh, taking a vacation, and I, so to speak, I'll be at my church. I'll just be sitting in a pew for a while, but then I'm going to Ipeva for one Sunday in June and then two more in July. So it seems like I'm going to be <laughs> back in the saddle again, uh, constantly going somewhere. So keep me in your prayers for uh, energy and um, wisdom and love as I continue to serve the broader church. And of course, keep our pastor in your prayers as she's going to be reascending to the pulpit in just a couple of weeks. And I'm sure you're all very excited to hear that, as is she. Let's, let's pray. Most gracious and loving God, we thank you yet again for a beautiful morning, a beautiful day in this world of yours. And we thank you for giving us the, the opportunity and the pleasure to come to your house and be among our people, our friends, our loved ones. We thank you, God, that we can come to a place of love and grace and understanding where all of your children, all of them, are welcome to the table of Jesus Christ. Most glorious God, we thank you for the relationships that you fostered here, and the strength and the wisdom and the profound transformation that we've all witnessed. Almighty God, we lift up Amanda's mother as she faces surgery, Lord God. We ask that you'll heal her and lay your hand upon her. Grant her strength and tenacity to overcome the pain of rehabilitation. So glorious God, we pray that you'll lay your hand of help and love and mercy on those who've been affected by storms here and abroad. We pray, Lord God, that the community might band together and lift up the broken. Lift up the hurting. Lift up those who've lost everything. Lord God, we pray for our friends in war-torn countries. We pray for our friends living in imminent danger. We ask, Lord God, you might guide them safely to a home where they can live freely. We ask, Almighty God, that you might change the hearts and minds of all of these people in these war-torn countries. May we finally wake up to the truth, God, that you do not call for violence, that violence is not the solution, the answer to all of our problems. Fill us with the peace, almighty God, and let us be the peace that you call us to be. Our loving Lord God, we pray for pastors. We pray for pastors who are tired, Pastors who are recovering, pastors who are fighting to reach your children, fighting to love your children. Most glorious God, we pray for congregations, for people who come together. Might you so love in their hearts? So inspiration in their souls to love and to serve your blessed community. All this we ask in Jesus' name, in the words that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We'll now sing our hymn of joy, Because He Lives, verses 1, 2, and 3, page 358 of the Blue Hymnal.
give you the same, I guess, caution that I gave the morning service. This is probably the most unorganized sermon I've ever done because there were so many different ways I wanted to take it and so many different things that I wanted to talk about that you're just going to kind of get a buffet of all of it. So brace yourselves. The first thing I really want to point out is something that I chuckled at this morning because I never noticed it until I was reading a little bit more about it this morning. But if you read in the text, in in your bulletin insert or in the Bible, there's no verse 4. It it goes from verse 3 to verse 5, and verse 4 has been omitted. And there's a reason for that. Um, If you're lucky enough, you'll have a a uh, footnote in your Bible, and I'll, I'll share with you the footnote that's in here. Other ancient authorities add, wholly or in part, waiting for the stirring of the water, for an angel of the ward went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever stepped in first after the stirring of water was made well from whatever disease that person had. That's an interesting element that that would have added to this text. But the textual critics who have have studied this and they've looked at different copies of the Gospels have found that that wasn't always there. Somebody added that much, much later. And the way that's done is back, way back when, when they were making copies of the Bible, they didn't just take the parchment and lay it onto a copy machine, kind of like the Flintstones. There was some woodpecker chipping out a new copy of the text. That's not how that went down. They would have entire schools of scribes all hunched together in a room, writing down what somebody else was reading from the copy that he had. And every once in a while, somebody would mess up. So we've got some copies out there with words omitted. We've got some copies out there with words changed. But then we also had other people who would take copies and copy them in their own setting. And you might encounter someone that says, well, I don't really like that, so they'd scribble it out and they wouldn't put it on. Or this needs a little bit extra, so they'd put it on there. And that's what's really fun about textual criticism, especially when we're dealing with the Gospels, because you really get a broader vision of what was going on. One other thing I kind of want to point out, too, is that this is a fairly good argument against the notions of absolute biblical literalism and inerrancy, because we really don't know what the Bible says sometimes. We're we're going off of our best guess, and this is a prime example that we've been editing the text since the beginning. Let us remember that our faith is in God. Savvy? And the other thing that I kind of want to point out, and, and kind of the thing I want to talk about this morning, is Christian love within the four walls of the church. Um, I kind of chuckled as I thought of that because I thought, oh great, he's talking about love again. It's all this guy ever talks about. But I think it's a necessary conversation because in the Jewish community that this setting, that this story was set in, this man who had been infirmed for 38 years had also not been to the temple for 38 years because he wouldn't be welcomed at the temple. He was unclean, right? He was infirmed, he was imperfect. There was, if you've you've never had the joy of looking into what would render a person unclean and therefore unworthy to go in the temple, it's a pretty long list. Childbirth, you're unclean, you can't come in the temple. Sexual relations, you're unclean, you can't come into the temple. Uh, If you've dealt with with a a, a dead relative. If you've dealt with the dead, you're unclean. You can't come into the temple. Now, that doesn't mean forever. There were rituals, there were purification rituals that you would have to go out and do before you could be welcomed back into the temple. But for all intents and purposes, with a um, 38-year malady, this, this person would not be welcomed into the temple. How often does the church do that still? Often, the church is up here, and, and, you know, we'll help you, but you need to come up here with us first. You need to, to act the way that 
well, that we think you need to act. You need to live according to the hand-picked laws that we like to hold you to before we'll be willing to help you and love you. And, and that's, that's just the way it is. But Jesus didn't approach this person like this. In fact, if you, if you read the text, there's a couple of differences here. This, this guy didn't reach out to Jesus. How do we usually see healings? It's usually somebody yelling, Son of God, save me. Son of God, deliver me. Son of God, heal me. Yeah, that didn't happen here. Nobody told this guy to shut up because he wasn't saying anything. Jesus walked up to him and asked him, Would you like to be made well? And did the guy say yes? Yes, please. Yes, pretty, please. No. He complained. Nobody's helping me. Absolutely. In fact, they just walk around me. Nobody's helping me get into this pool. And whenever I try to go in myself, somebody just kicks me out of the way. One of the other things that, that is kind of different here is Jesus doesn't tell him what he kind of normally tells people. Your faith has made you whole. That's what Jesus usually tells people, right? Your faith has made you whole. That's not at all what he said this time. Take up your mat and walk. And he did. Now, this guy didn't leave this place glorifying God and spreading the good news. And it's kind of funny. Jesus didn't even tell him not to tell anyone because that's usually one other thing that Jesus points out. I've healed you and I love you, but don't tell anybody. That didn't happen either. Jesus just told him to get up and walk. And he did. He didn't say thank you. You would have expected a thank you anyway. I mean, it's fine. You don't have to glorify my name, but thank you. That would be nice. In fact, it kind of goes the other way. Because that last line, this was the Sabbath. That was kind of taboo. You don't do things on the Sabbath. You don't do healings on the Sabbath. In fact, Jesus got in trouble with temple authorities on more than one occasion for healing on the Sabbath. And as we read on in the text, the temple, uh, the temple authorities do confront him on that. To which his answer is, hey, God works on the Sabbath. God heals on the Sabbath. God loves on the Sabbath. Why can't we? As we also read into that text, the authorities also confront the, the man who was healed. And he doesn't glorify God. He says, Hey, no, it wasn't me. It was him. He did it. Get him. So, man, that's, that kind of makes you not want to do anything nice for anyone, does it? You ever had that happen? You've ever reached out to someone to help them and you, you felt compassion and empathy for an individual? And without them asking, you're just like, you know what? You look like you need just a leg up. You look like you need a little help. And you've reached, them, you've reached out to them and they've not even acknowledged it and walk away. That's, that's really hard to want to do that for anyone ever again. Yet here we are sitting in this church, which is the, the pinnacle of that kind of, of, of relationship with, with humans. Jesus has said on more than one occasion, I didn't come here for the holy. I came here for the sick. So where we get this notion that people are going to walk through the front door of the sanctuary for the first time and have their stuff together and be perfect and be worthy of the love as we're trying to, to make ourselves. Now, that's, I don't know where we get that notion because it's not realistic. I mean, I came in here to preach today and I don't have it all together. Are you kidding me? Um, another thing I kind of wanted to share is this, and we're actually, I almost forgot to say this, and I'm glad it just popped into my mind. So the first time I came to this church, not even to preach, just to visit, I had mentioned to one of the pastors in the region, hey, I'm going to be checking out Parkway in Springfield. And they said to me in a very excited I mean, it was just one of those, ha oh, smile when they, when they spoke of this church. And they said, you're going to enjoy that place. Those people love each other. 
Those people love each other. Now don't let that go to your heads. <laughs> but I will say I have not been disappointed. I have not been disappointed because I think a lot of us get to a point where we show up to church on Sunday, chunk, just to punch our ticket. We did the holy thing. Now I can go to the restaurant and yell at the server for getting my coffee wrong. I've done the holy thing, now I can scoff at kids for dressing weird, right? Is that it's something we see a lot in churches. People punch their ticket, they pay no attention to, what, to anyone whatsoever. One, one thing that I was kind of sad to see go when the COVID uh, years spiked was the passing of the peace or the greeting. A lot of churches would get up and they would pass peace to one another. They would greet each other, and, and that kind of went by the wayside with the COVID generation. Um, because it, it, if you're willing to get up out of your seat and walk around and be seen by other people, which I know is difficult for people, you enter into community, into relationship with these people. And that's what this church is supposed to be. It's not a place where individuals show up just to get their, their weekly fill and then leave. This is a community. I'm gonna share a story, one that I'm not entirely comfortable sharing up here, and it's not even about me, but it's just the fact that it involves an expletive and you don't talk about that in church, but I digress, bear with me. Um, it was in the height of the COVID year, 2020. And because COVID-19 was such a thing, our church had pretty much shut down. So nobody was, was there on Sunday mornings other than maybe six of us, just enough people to make the service happen so we could live stream it, right? So one of the elder's daughters showed up one day. And I, I think the world of this person, she's, she's very bright. She's just a wonderful, caring soul. But she'd been having a kind of a rough go for kind of a while. One, she was a teacher in the COVID years. So right there is enough to, to have a little bit of empathy for this soul. Two, she'd been going through some serious relationship issues. She had met someone who seemed like a good guy and seemed like he had it all together. Um, and seemed like this would be somebody that you could spend the rest of your life with. Around this time, that relationship suddenly and somewhat violently ended. There was a D and ended, not ended and did. I just caught that. And then to top it off, she had just gotten the results on some tests that she'd had done. So the way the story goes, when she, she'd noticed a lump. And it was in the area of her womb. So that was a little bit disconcerting. And when she brought it to the to the attention of her doctor, her doctor said, no, that's nothing. Okay, but I know this wasn't always here, right? So after a while, she went and, and got a second opinion, and that doctor responded radically differently. Oh, that's not supposed to be there. Why is that there? We need to get you in for testing immediately because maybe it's nothing or maybe it's something, right? Well, it ended up being nothing. It ended up being a cyst. It was removed. She's okay. Um, but as all this, all of these three things, what does they usually say that bad things usually happen in threes? Well, this is a firm example of that. As all this was coming to a head, she was sitting in the church talking to us after the service had ended. We were just kind of mingling about how great the service went and how funny it was when Ben tripped and and all this, and she began to share a little bit about what was going on, because we could tell that something wasn't right. And she was crying, and as she shared, she referred to her former doctor with an expletive. And she said, I am so sorry that I said that in church. And I, I kind of thought about that, and I stepped back, and I thought, who on earth would shame this person for this just now? And I felt moved to talk, so I did. I told her, I said, if you can't come into this church to God's feet and lay out your anxieties, your fears, your frustrations, your angers, your weaknesses, whatever the affliction may be, 
then why on earth would you come? Why would you come? And if that's the word that you need to use to get it out, fine. I don't think God cares about that as much as we do. What I think God cares about is you and you and you and I living fully into the life that God calls us to be in, living fully into the love that God calls us to be in. And that love is community. That love is loving and serving God's children even when they don't like you, even when they aren't nice to you, even when they don't say thank you, even when they aren't worthy, even when they aren't worthy. Who among us is? Who among us is worthy? Really? If we get down to the 613 rules that each and every one of us has broken multiples of today, who's worthy? Because I'll tell you right now, if you're not worthy, I'm not worthy. If, if the people begging on the streets are not worthy, then I'm not worthy. If the people suffering from addiction, if the people rotting in jail cells right now are not worthy, I'm not worthy. In fact, if I'm not, not only am I not worthy, but I'm not willing if they aren't worthy. I want no part of this. God's people, all of them, every last one, fearfully and lovingly made in God's own image. Uh, there's a book that I've been recently getting back into, and I think I've mentioned it from this pulpit before, but I'm going to mention it again because it is a profound book on the word that I'm going to teach you in a moment, and if you haven't heard it yet. But it's a book called Tattoos on the Heart, and it's written by Father Greg Boyle, who accidentally started the largest uh, gang reformation program in the world. In the world. And it just started by leaving the church and loving the people as God calls us to love. And one thing he says that's always stuck to me is this. This is the kind of compassion that we want. The kind of love that stands in awe of the burden carried by the poor and the broken. Not how they carry it. Can you feel the difference there? Can you feel the difference to how we should respond to people there? That's the kind of love that God calls us into outside, inside, and everything in between. Keep up the good work in this church. I'm, I'm excited to see the direction this church is going. I'm excited to see the things this church is doing. I got the email uh, last week about the, the change that's coming to this church, and that's exciting too. Because we, we, we change from just being a church to doing church. And I know that sometimes we make this thing about numbers. That's bothered me in the past when I've showed up to a church and there's, for the main event service, there's, you know, 15 people there. It's not about numbers. It really isn't about numbers. It's about allowing the transformation to happen. The numbers will sort themselves out. We're not trying to sell anybody anything here, right? If we're willing to be who God calls us to be and love how God calls us to love, then that's really all we need. Amen. We'll now sing, he's got the whole world in his hands, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, in the blue hymnal, page 586. <laughs>
Good morning again. My name is Marcia, and I'm privileged to serve as your elder today. And I stand before you today as your elder for the last time before I enter into my new role. I've been known to give what they call, many people are calling many sermons up here during my elder meditation, but it's going to be different today. Uh, I think you'll hear enough of my sermons in the coming months. Um, if anybody knows me, they know, and you can ask Amanda, I like to reminisce, especially when changes occur in my life or in other people's lives. So like, I like to look back at pictures or things that were written back in the day, and that's just something I do. It's kind of how I process things. And Friday evening, I decided to look up and read my very first elder message that I gave, which back then we called Stewardship Moment. We did it a little different. Um, and I found it, and it was in February 2019. Uh, doesn't seem too long ago, but it still seems way long ago with everything we've gone through. Uh, little did I know when I accepted my calling as elder where it would lead me. I had no clue. But I can tell you without a doubt, the Holy Spirit has been guiding me the entire way the past four years. So today I want to read the message that I shared that very first day. And I'm going to read it because I don't have it memorized. Good morning. I am Marcia, and I have the privilege to serve as your elder today for the first time. To be honest, this was not the first time I was asked to be an elder here at Parkway. I was actually asked two other times. I felt humbled and privileged each time I was asked to serve, not only in this capacity at our church, but also in other areas in which I was asked to serve here at our church. From the gathering prayer to leading other capacities and committees. Now with that said, it's key to point out that I didn't always say yes when I was asked to serve or lead. Obviously, the two other times I was asked to be elder, I declined. I declined for many different reasons. I'm sure I had my life reasons, like we all do, such as I had still worked weekends, Madison was still very young, we were trying to figure out how to juggle a family of three now, um, things like that. But I can assure you this, I prayed every time before I made my decision. And when I prayed, I did not feel in my heart that it was the right time. I did not feel God wanted me to serve as elder just yet. I did not feel what I call the Holy Spirit nudge. Now this time, I did. As a matter of fact, I felt through God, I felt as though God was nudging me even before I was asked, and I believe it was Karen that called me. And I knew already that God was wanting me to do this, whether I was felt ready or not. I knew no matter what I had going in my life, no matter how nervous I was standing up here, no matter how unworthy I may feel being able to serve as elder, no matter what responsibilities may fall on my plate during these years, and there was many, God was going to be with me through it all. The Holy Spirit is going to guide me through this as long as I stay connected and I ask for advice and guidance. Now the reason why I'm saying this is that I invite all of you and challenge all of you to make sure that you are staying connected to God and asking God in which ways you can serve not only here, but outside these walls. To be God's hands and feet as God invites us to. To be sure that we listen to the Holy Spirit when he's nudging. No matter what apprehensions you may have, fear, time, etc., that you remember that if God is asking you to do it, God will be there with you through it all. The Holy Spirit will lead us day by day and to the perfect plan our Lord has for us. God knows where to take you and the exact time to do it. It is our job to listen and follow through when we hear the calling. I invite us all to serve. I invite us all to be good stewards, and I invite us all to ask God to lead us, knowing God is right there. That was 2019, my very first elder message. I remember it. I was nervous. I have a different 
calling here at Parkway now. A calling that I am so grateful and humbled in my heart to step into. Like when I become elder, became elder, I know God is going to be right there with me. Church, God is right here with each and every one of you. Each and every one of you. Nudging us to follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit into the place and into the service that God wants for each of us. So let us stay connected. Let us listen. And let us strengthen our relationship with God and step forward one foot in front of the other in complete and total faith. Faith is what has gotten us here. When we do this, not if we do this, but when we do this, God will bring Parkway into the fulfillment of God's divine plan for this church, for the church members, and for the community, and for the world. I believe that all my heart. So thank you all for the privilege to serve as your elder. And thank you so much for supporting me as I step into a more pastoral role here at Parkway. Please pray with me. Lord, we want to thank you for being with us, for change, helping us to change to the church that you want us to be, but yet be the same church that we've always been. God, it's through you that we can become the church that we are intended to be, that we can become the people, the disciples you want us to be. Help us to listen to the Holy Spirit and help us to take down the obstacles that we put in our lives that keeps us from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hymn number 460 in your blue hymnal. Let us break bread together, verses 1, 2, and 3. one by one by name. So the risen Christ calls each of us one by one by name to come and share at this table in a community of love. Let us eat and drink with Christ within the universal fellowship of those who are loved without reservation, just as they are. Please pray with me. Jesus, it is through your sacrifice that we are not only saved, but we can live in the presence of our Creator. 
building a relationship that can guide us each and every day. We are so grateful that we are able to share this meal in remembrance of you and all that you offer us. Let it renew our spirit as we leave here today and share your light with the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This bread and this cup is not just physical sustenance, nor is it just spiritual sustenance. It's also a token of our commitment and recommitment to one another and to that path of God. It is a token of our commitment to loving and serving all of God's people, indiscriminately, seeking nothing in return. As we do this, God fills our hearts and our minds with the transformative love that God pours out on all those who follow him. No greater an example was it than that night before he was betrayed that Jesus gathered with his disciples and he took bread and he blessed it and broke it, saying, take this and eat, all of you. This is the broken body of Christ. After the supper had ended, in the same manner, Jesus took the cup. And lifting it said, This is the cup of the new covenant, poured out for all people. I tell you, I shall not drink of it again, until I share it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. I ask you now to take and drink, and as you do, do always in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes again. Most gracious and loving God, we thank you for your bread that fills our bellies. We thank you, Lord God, for the bread that inspires us and energizes us, Lord God. May we take that, that energy, that inspiration, and that love that comes from your bread and your cup and pour out onto your community, your people, your kingdom. Open our eyes, Lord God, that we might see that all of creation is your creation. Amen. We'll now sing, Take the Name of Jesus with you, verses 1, 2, and 3 on page 235 of the Blue Hymnal. Mm -hmm. 